Good afternoon, everyone. This is a bittersweet day because today, as we mourn Sir Jack and pay tribute to him, I know he'd want us to celebrate his lifelong work and the remarkable creation of this magic city we call our home, and all in a mere 60 years. The word bittersweet is a contradiction, and Jack was, in fact, a man of many contrasts, magnanimous and frugal, intractable and impressionable, theatrical and understated, hardworking and playful, friendly and frightening. As Jez Moxie of the Wolves said, a man with big ideas, interested in the smallest details. As we know, back in 1955, the year, the year I was born, his father, Sir Charles Haywood, Wallace Groves, and the Allens first conceived the concept of a city called Freeport with the government of the day and signed it into reality in the Hawkesville Creek Agreement. Jack arrived in 1956 at Pine Ridge in a Grummond Goose flying boat operated by Bahamas Airways. And I'm told back in those days, planes only had a compass and a fuel gauge. And these charter flights were apparently flown by one of two pilots. According to Jack, you wanted Tubby Welsh. As the saying went, if you love your hubby, fly with Tubby, and if your soul is ready, fly with Eddie. <laughs> that was Jack's story. Jack lived in a, a Nissan hut, working by gaslight and driving on timber trails. Wallace had actually been here from the 1940s, and Marina Gottlieb writes about her parents' arrival in her book, Sand in My Shoes. She says, in the 1940s, Pine Ridge was truly a pioneer settlement. I am awed by the courage and tenacity it must have taken to live in a place so isolated from civilization. I try to imagine what my parents must have felt when they flew over the flat, desolate island of Grand Bahama. They were foreigners in a strange land brought here by the hand of fate and a wealthy American businessman called Wallace Groves. Living conditions were primitive. Life was devoid of comfort. Grocery stores were non-existent. Food was scraped from cans till they could grow their own vegetables and learn how to fish. Jack said there were no amenities, no schools, no medical facilities, apart from Dr. Gottlieb's clinic, which was a chicken coop. There was a cluster of Bahamian families, forgive me if I can't mention everyone, uh, like Hayward Cooper, who in those days drove the only taxi, the Wilchcombs and Grants in the west, and Pinders in the east, and, and even a figure from my childhood, Albert Leshevin, of whom it was said that he was Papillon, a real-life SKP from Devil's Island. Only a handful of people are left who can remember those early days, and actually witnessed Freeport grow one day at a time, from Pine Ridge producing pit props and pulpwood to a metropolitan garden city and port. Doug Silvera is one. He, he once had to fish Jack's Mercury station wagon out of a blue hole. How it got there, no one knows. Maybe Jack was trying out one of his famous shortcuts. The driving force behind Freeport in the next decades was the trio, Sir Jack, my father, Edward St. George, and of course, Sir Albert Miller, like the three musketeers. Hardy, hardworking, resourceful, and always with a sense of humor, standing shoulder to shoulder with their respective families alongside them. Rick, Sue, and Jonathan would remember those days. Jack never lost that optimism, enthusiasm, steadfastness, which as the Prime Minister and former Prime Minister has said, stayed the course through good times and bad. They didn't just build the infrastructure of the day, they built the infrastructure of the future. You've heard the famous World War I epitaph. They gave their today for our tomorrow. Well, they did. 
Just look at the canal system and the dual carriageways. As we know, the port was dredged, hotels and homes were built, multinational businesses came, local enterprises were born, tourism prospered. Jack, my father, and Sir Albert believed in long-term equity investment, and that's why you see so much of it. Worth some $11 billion today at the last count. And we're emerging from a world recession. We're on track for more economic growth. The IDB has said so. So let's get everyone here a job. So Jack loved nature too, as Erica has said. Hence, Garden City. Part of Jack's dream was that Freeport should always be self-sustaining, both economically and environmentally. Natural capital and man-made capital, hand in hand. Trees bring clouds, clouds bring rain. Rain replenishes the water table, and water is a key part of industrial activity. You know the saying, if you want a rainbow, you've got to put up with the rain. Jack was obsessed with his rain gauge, and actually spent an hour or so in Florida in his 90s pottering up and down the aisles of a superstore, looking for one for me as a present. And he loved that dredging a deep water port was twinned with the mining of limestone for export. How many other places have depleted their natural resources in the quest for progress? What was he like to work with? Well, when I first approached Jack's office, I was greeted with a ceramic sign hanging on the door. It said, I can only please one person a day. Today is not your day, and tomorrow doesn't look good either. <laughs> After that, it was like a ritual. I'd ask, is today my day? And he'd always reply, no, it isn't. Jack, as you know, was an exceptionally generous benefactor and philanthropist, but never presume. This was a man who would still stop to pick up paper clips from the floor because he said he hated waste. And I remember that Patty Bloom's brother, Dick, sent Jack and me a large, expensive, and heavy box of chocolate brittle, a Denver delicacy. A few days later, Donna appeared, clutching a small bill, and in her soft-spoken voice said, Sir Jack says that as you've eaten half the box with your brother Henry and your friend Fatima, you should pay for half the customs duty. <laughs> True. In his office, romantic tales of daring do still adorn his bookshelves. I spotted a lovely one the other day. Cockle Shell Canoes, a book on World War II British military canoes. And for years, there was a wooden propeller from a tiger moth on his wall with the inscription to Flight Lieutenant J.A. Hayward, RAF, for deeds performed in India and Burma beyond the realms of sanity. Jack, I don't want to skip the page here. The minister of Grand Bahama said to IDB governors last week, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. And no one could ever accuse Jack of being dull. Jack's work here was his life, like my father, and so their work day never stopped at five o'clock or weekends or even holidays, as both Jack and Daddy's families well know. Perhaps that's why Jack and my father were so at home here in the Bahamas, because of that ability to appreciate every day, to laugh, to find time to chat, not just make a business appointment, to meet rather than have a meeting. That's the essence of life here. And of course, as surely as they were in the process of shaping Freeport, they themselves were shaped by Freeport. Jack didn't know the word overtime. When he saw employees leaving at 5.30, his Shakespearean stage voice would boom out congenially, mind you don't get caught up in the stampede. When presented with a proposal, Jack and my father always felt it should be put on no more than two pages, or better yet, on one. And never try to blind him with science, or pie charts, or capex, because if you did, he was apt to quote from St. Paul's address to the Philippians, 
He'd listen to the presentation and then pronounce solemnly, well, that was like the peace of God. It passes all understanding. <laughs> he admitted he wasn't a number cruncher and he didn't need to be. We have Arthur Jones, Ian Roll and Deanne Seymour have accountancy backgrounds, my father, Ian Barry, Don Delarue before that, and all the way back to Wallace the Wizard. Jack was a field man at heart. He'd often say, I take a different road to the office every day to avoid assassination. But of course, as Willie Moss recalls, he was always on the lookout for potholes and missing signs and cat's eyes. And in budget meetings, Jack would simply turn to the page Freeport maintenance and road repairs. They all roared with laughter one meeting when he exclaimed, Luna Boulevard, Albert, isn't that your street? Well, we're not redoing that this year. <laughs> and if you got on his bad side before a board meeting, you were likely to get a revised agenda with a new first item on it headed, early retirement of the following persons. <laughs> Jack was obsessed with the English language and heads rolled if there was a misplaced R, or, or misplaced anything, actually, as the PR department and Ginger would remember. Of course, the spelling also had to be non-American, like, like this service sheet. Honor with a U, harbor with a U, program spelt double M-E, and of course, licensee with a C and not an S. He even tried to correct the spelling of Lincoln Center, to center Ari till he was reminded that that was its official name. Imagine poor Andre Cartwright, who commissioned hundreds of company pens. We still have them, by the way. These were elegant, burgundy and gold, handsomely packaged, and everyone oohed and aahed. And then Jack's eagle eye spotted the inscription, the Grand Bahama Pot Authority. <laughs> I have one here with me. Here it is. <laughs> Jack, Jack would tell people, as Patty reminded me, you can say what you like about me, but just spell my name right. <laughs> well, today, we can only say thank you. Thank you for building this home we all share. Thank you for the vision we all believe in and which we pledge to continue. Jack was terminally ill for some time, but he never let on. Last Christmas, he was only given a month to live, but didn't say. He worked till his last day here, and he was determined to go on his annual Christmas cruise, which, thanks to Patty, Amy, and Mike, he did, carried aboard in a wheelchair. Sadly, it was to be cut short. And I'll always be grateful we had a chance to say our last silent farewells to him in hospital in Florida. Here today at Christ the King, as we reflect on Jack's Herculean achievements, we honor his virtues, we forgive his flaws, and treasure these fond memories. How do you define someone who simply doesn't have it in him to give up or to give in. Someone who loved life right up to his last breath. Dylan Thomas, a favorite of my father's, wrote, wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Thank you.